Altana and where will we be without your great sacrifice, Lord? Thank you for your faithfulness and for your grace. And thank you for being our way maker. And I promise you, as we go into the rest of the service, I pray that you will speak to us and let us hear the things that you want us to hear. And thank you for your amazing love. And you we ask that you take us through the rest of this service, thy ears and eyes open, to be receptive to what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The Bible reading is taken from Luke chapter 16, reading from verses 10 to 15. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So our scientist says he gives us time and it's so valuable. It's even more valuable than money because you can't buy more time, right? but you can earn more money. So uh, we will look at today the stewardship of money. And uh, the story goes that uh, the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Sir Winston Churchill, once uh, uh, took a, a taxi uh, and uh, uh, from, uh, he, he took it to uh, the BBC offices for an interview. And uh, when he arrived, uh, he asked the driver to, to wait for 40 minutes uh, until he got back. But the driver apologized and said, uh, I can't because I have to go home and listen to uh, Winston Churchill's speech. He hadn't recognized his passenger, so he was in the back lobby wrapped up, so he didn't know who he was taking to the office. And uh, Winston Churchill was amazed and, and delighted that the man's, uh, you know, for the man's desire to listen to his speech. Uh, so he took out a, a 20 pound note, which was a huge amount of money at that time, and he gave it to the taxi driver without telling him who he was. And uh, when the driver collected the money, he said, uh, So I'll wait for hours until you come back and let Churchill go to hell. You can see how principles have been modified in favor of money. Nations are sold for money. Honor is sold for money. Families split up because of money. Friends are separated because of money. People are killed for money. And people are being made slaves for money. And that's why it's so important that we look at this because Jesus also speaks about money. And Jesus speaks the words that we heard in the Gospel of St. Luke just now in chapter 16 and verses uh, 10 to 13. And uh, 
he these words are immediately after telling the parable of the unjust servant or the unjust steward right it comes immediately after that so in the parable of the unjust steward uh, is the steward the unjust steward is caught squandering his master's money and is called to give an account of how he used his master's money and realizing that he had been caught he begins to use the master's money to make friends for himself so that when he no longer has a job he will at least have friends while clearly unjust uh, because he misused his master's money jesus points to this man as an example of someone who is true and jesus says in the second part of uh, verse 8 in this same chapter he says for the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light now jesus is not condoning does not condone this steward's dishonesty but points to how clever and shrewd he is and the moral of this parable is that if the wicked can be shrewd can be this shrewd in the things which are temporary which are temporal how much more shrewd should we be in dealing with the things which are eternal and that is the point that jesus wants to make and jesus is saying that if you cannot be trusted with something as temporal as as a fleeting as money he is not going to trust us with the truly valuable things of the spirit and if we have not proven faithful with little we will never be entrusted with much and if we are not faithful with that with that which belongs to someone else who will give us something of our own that is the question and then jesus tells us that you cannot serve two masters you cannot serve both god and money he does not say you should not he say you cannot it's not possible and don't overlook the fact that these four verses that were read to us are sandwiched in between two parables not only of the unjust steward but also of lazarus and the rich man which follows and both of these parables talk about how wise or foolish someone here how man is here on earth and how they the how they use of money here speaks to eternity See both of the parables directly deal directly with money. And we know this from verse 14 from verse 14 uh where the scripture tells us the Pharisees were listening and scoffing at him right they were they were sneering right it says that they were lovers of money that's what happens when you become a lover of money and someone tells you the truth you don't even realize it you just scoff at them now i want you to think about money in 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 four simple terms right in four terms first of first it is a trust right it is something god has entrusted to our care right? something which belongs to him but which he has given to us to invest on his behalf so we must look at it, look at look at it, look at money as as a trust the idea here is that he will get a good return on his investment right? if he trusts us with little and we use it wisely he will trust us with more that's why he says in verse 10 he who is faithful in very little thing is faithful also in much so money is something god has entrusted to us it is a trust the second is it is a tool 
He expects that we will use it to further his kingdom here on earth. Using it as the best as we can to reveal his glory and to relate his gospel to those around us. And to the one who is spiritually minded, money is never something which should be used, which should become an end in itself. It should never become an end unto itself. But merely, it is rather, it is merely a tool, something which is to be used to accomplish a greater good. Something of far greater value than it. It's, it's, if I give an example, it's like a rope thrown into the water to save someone from drowning. Right? The rope is not what is of real value. The life being saved is what is of real value. The rope is just a tool that you use. And so it is with money. It has value, but only to the degree to which it is used properly. Only to the degree that it is used to further the kingdom of God. So, the second aspect is, we have to look at is that we, can, we have to use it, it's a tool that God has given us. The third is, is that it is a test. It's a test. God often gives us something of lesser value to see if we, he can trust us with something of greater value. And that's logical, right? You don't give someone immediately something that, you know, they just cannot handle. So if he cannot trust us with something as fleeting as money, why should he trust us with spiritual things of eternal value? If he cannot trust us to make good decisions with the small amount of money that we have, it stands to reason that we cannot be trusted with the large amount of money that we may want. And I'm sure you know, most people want more money. But can we be trusted with that? Would it not bring us great harm if we did not know how to use it? And just for the record, God can give you as much money as he wants to give you. And he can leave you with as little as he wants to leave you with. Both options are open. And when we are dealing with someone who has a very heartbeat in his hands, we shouldn't quibble over something as temporary, as temporal as money. We should seek to pass the test and use it as he commands us. So, thirdly, it is a test. And the fourth thing is that it is a thermometer. When you come in every day, every Sunday now, you get your temperature checked, a digital thermometer. And this money is also something like that. How we spend our money reveals the truth about our spiritual value, lives. It reveals something about our lives. Now, just take, you know, just think for a moment here. If you do not at the very least tithe, if you are not investing at least a portion of the money God has entrusted to you into eternal causes, really you are not growing, you are not a growing Christian and you probably need to take a long, hard look at your life through the lens of scripture to see if you are even a Christian at all. Now that may sound like a very harsh statement, but Jesus makes it abundantly clear that you cannot serve God and money. He talks about money more than heaven and hell combined. It is clear Jesus thought the use of money was, a, was an important thermometer of our spiritual lives. If you are truly his servant, 
If I am truly his servant, then we need to surrender everything in our lives to him. And one of the most elementary, external, visible signs of that internal transformation is that you will walk in obedience to him with respect to money as well. So, go through the scripture from the Old Testament through to the New Testament and you will find the same message. You will find the same message. Of course, there are, always have been, those who have a problem with this truth. You know, there are people sometimes who are involved in Christian ministry who think that, you know, they have dedicated their, their lives to God or they, they have most of their time to God's service and that they don't have the time. And that's, that's a cop-out, you know, it's, it's similar to what Jesus condemned the Pharisees for. In Matthew uh, chapter 15 and verse 5 and 6, uh, he talks about this. He talks about how they have manipulated this through their traditions. When money was, was set aside by people to look after their mother and father, a command to honor their father and mother, they would say, oh, we are dedicating it to God. And then disobey his command to look after their parents. That's how they manipulate it. The call to total surrender is not just for people who preach God's word or are involved in God's ministry. It's for everyone. It's for all Christians. So, how can you say you are willing to give your life to Christ if you are not willing to surrender your purse or your wallet to Him? How can He truly be the Lord of your life if He is not Lord of your bank account? There is no way around it either. You can say, well, money is not that important. Surely God is more concerned about how I treat my neighbor than how I spend my money. You might say that. But how you spend your money speaks to how you treat your neighbor. Do you give to the poor when they need it? Are you willing to fund the ministries, the mission, the activities of your church so that others might come to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and be saved? You see, you cannot separate the stewardship of your money from the rest of your spiritual life. It's part and parcel of it. So the clock and the rupee tell the story, don't they? And when, it's all, when everything is said and done, they are simple matters of obedience and obedience defines our discipleship. They are tangible evidence of where our hearts are. So that's why I asked you last time to think, reflect on where your heart is. Because that's where your treasure is as well. Mind you, none of us have mastered all of these, these disciplines in the Christian life. But I, I am, it's a growth process. I am also in that process. I'm not talking down to you. I am telling you what God expects of all of us. So, those who are following, are followers of Christ are on a pathway of growth. It's a growth process, a lifelong growth process, ever seeking to be what He has called us to be and to do what He has called us to do. That is the process we are on. And that is the path that we have to choose to go. So now, allow me to suggest several things which might help you grow in this area of your walk with Christ. Uh, 
These are practical steps because I always believe that when God teaches us something, there is always a need to apply his word into our lives, that it may transform our lives. So, the first suggestion is that you assess your time and money expenditures. Uh, it would amaze you to know how many people have no real idea of how they spend their time and money. All of us have a vague idea of how we uh, spend our time and money, but you might consider keeping a record for a few days of time and money expenditures. For most people, this will be a, a very uh, profitable exercise. And I'll, I'll tell you what happened when I first got married. I know my wife is probably thinking because she's heard this story. I've told some others. As you know, my wife's an accountant. So when we first got married, she told me, you know, we need to keep a ledger. And uh, you have to enter all your expenses in that ledger. So there was this little book that she had prepared and, and it had different columns. Accountants love columns. Uh, so there was receipts, uh, there was household expenses, entertainment, uh, when you buy food out, uh, capital expenditure, standard payments, uh, medical expenses, the vehicle expenses, the vehicle, utility bills, uh, gifts and, uh, and, and donations, tithes, and another column called miscellaneous. So being the meticulous you know, our medical training tends us to be very meticulous. So, to the very last cent, I used to enter all my expenses, you know, 25 cents and 75 cents. So, at the end of the month, my, my wife used to go through this book and, 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 and close the accounts. And I noticed after some time that in this miscellaneous column, there is a figure. It's just a figure. He says, miscellaneous expenses. And I said, I, what is this? He says, no, I just have to balance the books. So that's a figure I had put in. It was my expenses. But it really did teach us. It taught us how we were spending our money. It really told us where our money went. And it was a very useful exercise. So, I would suggest that you also do this with your time and your money. Then you will understand how you spend it. The second is to set some goals. And you can start out simply, uh, but set some goals as to where you are going to spend your time and your money. But prioritize your life on, on paper and then live it out. It may be uh, as simple as just writing down on a piece of paper the things you need to accomplish each day or the amount of money you will allow to this or that. But make sure your goals head you towards obedience to Christ's commands. Remember, our goal is to become more like Jesus, you know, not more like Dominic uh, Pereira or <laughs> Whoever is, you know, I think Bill Gates makes some like 550 million a day or something like that. It's worth. I think that's Damka Perra's value. Uh, I think Bill Gates makes about 30 million dollars a day. Uh, but anyway, we are not supposed to be trying to, you know, model, uh, model them or copy them. We may like you, but we are there to model the character and, of Jesus Christ. The third thing is to exercise some faith. Do it. Step outside of your comfort zone and do what God has commanded you to do. And trust Him to take care of everything else. You will find that a life surrendered to Christ can accomplish more in a smaller amount of time than one in your control. Try it. Test it. The same goes with money. 
money that is surrendered to his control goes a lot further and lasts a lot longer than money under our control. And at the end of the day, either we are or we are not Christians. You know, in this secular world we live in, in this pluralistic day in which we live, we have the make-believe Christians, you know, we have make-believe Christians. And we need to come to terms with the reality of our faith and recognize it for what it is or what it is not. If we are Christians in name only, if our faith doesn't make it any further than our lips and it never translates into a changed life, a life lived with the kind of discipline that Jesus calls for, a life that demonstrates surrender and sacrifice, we are no different from a host of other religious philosophies. And this is the call of Jesus. It was and is radical. It is a call to total surrender. It is a call to follow him in totality, not just partially. It is a call to life service, not merely to lip service. And we cannot expect the world around us to believe that we really believe it if we are not willing to practice what we preach. That's the thing. And Jesus did not give us lip service. He gave us his life. And over the last few weeks we have recalled that on Calvary's cross, he laid it all down. He left the glory of heaven for the grief of the cross. He surrendered to the agony of the cross, all for love, so that you and I could one day inherit eternal life. And that's why I leave you with uh, three uh, questions for reflection. Think about this. See, if he held nothing back for you and me, why should we hold back anything from him? What does your stewardship say about the authenticity of your faith? And thirdly, what does it say about where your trust really is? Think about these things. We live in obedience to his call upon our lives and everything that he has given us. He owns it all. We are just there to manage it as he wants us in obedience to him. So that at the end of the day, he will say, be able to say, welcome my good and faithful servant. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you that you teach us to live according to your will and purpose. We pray, Father, that your spirit will lead us in obedience to your word, to be doers of your word, and not just hearers. That in the area of stewardship of what you have given in our lives, for us to use, for your glory, Father, may we use it wisely and well. May we be faithful stewards of everything that you have given us, our time, our money included. Father, we ask that you will enable us, that you will transform us into the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ, who sacrificed it all for us. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty and matchless name. Amen.